really want nap time because it's a way of forcing you to behave. It's controlled behavior. Here, I don't care if you behave because I could wrestle all of you. She would protect me. Although she might not protect me from in favor of you because she loves your mustache. Someday I aspire to Duncan's mustache. All right. Boy, my YouTube, uh, my YouTube starts are always terrible. <laughs> huh? Um, so welcome to my channel. Uh, please like and subscribe. Just hit that like button down there and uh, hit the subscribe button for more great content and uh, subscribe to my Patreon. Uh, what? Oh, and ring the bell for notifications. Um, ding a ding a ding. Um, you get more great content from people like me. Um, so today we're gonna be giving more great content from me. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start with uh, just doing a little bit of a. Um, let's talk about uh, digital systems. Um, oh heck yeah! Wow. <laughs> There's three lines. Damn near That's a compound sentence. <laughs> I want to be a lecturer, but I think I can just be your housewife. I <laughs> got <laughs> 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 Her dream is to be a legend. I love to rush on top of the Oh, good times. I'll take it. All right. Um, that's a huge compliment in my world. All right, so this is chapter seven. Okay, um, so as we get into chapter seven, we're leaving behind a whole lot of concepts that we were talking about. To this point, most of our conversation has been centered around power. Oh shoot, I was gonna give you an AC Powers example. <clears throat> no, that's not happening. Okay, when we talk about power, we are talking about voltage and current together. That's what power is, it's voltage times current. So everything to date has been, how do we calculate voltage, how do we calculate current so that we can determine power, okay? Because once we know power, we can do a lot with power. But there is a second element to digital systems, well, to uh, electronic systems, that isn't just power, but is information. Okay? Digital systems has the ability to communicate information. Now, you can communicate information through power. Okay? I do that every day on my flex. I thought you weren't going to pay attention. <laughs> uh, that's, that's dumb. Um, but we, you can communicate information through power. But more than that, what we use is, is uh, most of the communication that we send and receive in today's world is through letters, I guess, or your phone. But prior to the invention of the cell phone, most of the communication that you sent and received, well, at that point it might have been emails. Prior to the internet, most of the communication that you sent and received were, uh, was sound-based. Like right now, I'm yelling at all of you, okay? Well, <laughs> nice. It's like, it's like a, uh, we, Seth, you're gonna have to come up here, do a face reveal. <laughs> Smart man. 
Yeah, at this point, it's just me and Duncan going to jail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks. National champions right here. <laughs> so you, you like, you won it all. Like. Uh, we won trap. So trap yeah. yeah, but that's like still, that's everything. That's like. Yeah, so you've got like, but I mean, that is. Well, that's NAIA, but still, that's, you can confidently say you're some of the best in the country. So, yeah, I feel pretty safe. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Tiny UFOs, I got this. <laughs> oh, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Okay, so we, when it comes down to this, we don't just have to look at power. We can also look at communication here, okay? Um, and most communication we have is analog. When I shout at you, I am creating an analog system with my vocal cords that is causing pressure waves to vibrate in a very specific way that is read by your ears as communication. All right? <laughs> Why are you paying attention to the weirdest points of this lecture? Oh, because you guys have shotguns. Do you use shotguns? Heck yeah, that's how we do it in the West. No, we use pellet rifles. Pellet rifles. I have a shotgun. I suppose that makes sense. If somebody died at one of those events. We, I've known of one person who has died in like the past 200 years. Yeah. It's still, I mean, you, you just don't want to get that bad rap. You realize that fewer people have died doing rifling than have died playing football? That's kind of weird. There, there have been people who died while playing football. And there are fewer people who have died. Oh, yeah. There's less, less people who have died <laughs> shooting black shotguns and stuff in the past 200 years than probably playing football in the last 25. Good fun fact in high school and college is not a single rest of the green shotguns. In the past, like, I don't know why it's just a hit somebody. That's good. Oh, well, I would have been the first because I'd be the guy who would, like, pull a shoulder muscle. Ah! Hurt. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's let's try to have a lecture. Okay. So when it comes to information, information is is a, a really a really critical piece. So here, let's say I'm going to send some information as a sine curve. Okay. This could this would be like the signal that you receive. Uh, from a radio transmitter. Um, it picks up this signal and then it would be able to transmit it and convert it directly into a, a, a voltage system like this. So this is what you would receive, okay? And we could take this and we could actually use this to say, I understand what is being communicated. It is a transmission of information, okay? Well, this becomes dramatically different if all of a sudden we have a slight voltage skew. So let's say this is my radio transmitter, but the signal is a little weak. So what I ended up picking up instead is this. Okay? Now, there's not a lot of difference. Just looking at that, those, those are identical. It's just voltage shifted. The problem is, if we're reading this voltage system, these are dramatically different values. Like, we recognize that the intensity is similar, but they're dramatically different. That actually poses a lot of problems. If we wanted to, let's say I wanted to say that I want to transmit to 
uh, Zane, I want to send you the number five, okay? And I only want to send the number five. I'm going to send five volts, okay, to Zane. Zane is going to receive five volts. Problem is that me sending five volts to Zane, it goes through a wire. And as that wire gets longer and longer, a longer wire has more resistance. By the time it reaches you, it's actually only two volts. Okay? Which means Zane says, you sent me a two. And I say, no, I sent you a five. When it comes to digital communication, the longer the distance, well, when it comes to communication using digital, uh, uh, electric systems, the longer distance you transmit that information over, the lower that voltage becomes. This is part of the reason why we have to use AC systems, is because in an AC system, uh, because you're constantly pushing and pulling, uh, the, the uh, resistance impedance ends up being, uh, it, it does not reduce the voltage, but it serves as a complex impedance whereby using other components also allows you to reduce that impedance, but it still has the same sine curve. I don't know, it's the reason why uh, Tesla, Tesla wanted to do, was it Tesla who wanted to do DC systems or was that Edison? I don't know. What? I can't remember, but it was Tesla and Edison had a big battle to, because I think it was Edison who believed that DC systems were better. So he, Edison believed that you needed to basically have a DC substation in every neighborhood. Well, the person who advocated for AC ended up winning. <laughs> because uh, there was a lot of really bad public image that came out like, AC systems kill elephants. So they actually electrocuted an elephant as a way of showing like AC systems are bad. Um, but in reality, the, the reason why AC systems won is because you could transmit an AC system over many miles without a significant loss in voltage, whereas you can only transmit a DC system over about 100 feet before you have you suffer substantial voltage losses. So, fun fact, that's why we have AC power. Um, but in today's world, a lot of people, because it is much simpler to have a DC converter, you now have the ability to have a fully DC house uh, because the DC converter is affordable. You have, ever, you have a DC converter in your laptop charger. Those things cost like 20 bucks. Sometimes a hundred bucks, but no, well, that's all it is. You put one of those in your house, it is now very affordable to have a DC converter. We could have entirely DC systems in our buildings. In a building this size, an entirely DC system would still suffer from the 100 foot voltage loss issue, so you'd probably have to place multiple DC converters, but yeah, anyways. So we run into this problem. Zane receives two volts, I send uh, five volts. It's not the same, okay? He reads a very different message. To combat this, what we have to do is we need a signal that is magnitude independent, okay? But more than that, say I send Zane a five volt signal. And let's say I just used a giant cord. So when it gets to you, it is five volts. Well, the problem is, is that uh, uh, Evan was uh, watching Amazing Spider-Man 2, fell into a vat of electric eels. And now Evan just produces his own natural electricity. Um, so the actual signal that you read, Zane, is this. Wait, so you fell into a battle of electric while watching Spider-Man? Yeah, while watching Spider-Man. Whoa, this is pretty neat. 
Man, Andrew Garfield sucks as Spider-Man, but this movie is pretty nice. Oh, electric eels. What? What? Yeah. Independent. Independent. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. <laughs> so we need a signal that is magnitude independent. But here, what is Zane going to be able to pull out of this? I'm sending him five volts, and Zane says, well, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's six. You take an average, what if it's 5.5? And what if, you, what, if you don't, what if you take an average down here? That's 4.5. You take an average over here, that might be six. You take an average across all of it, you might get five. You gotta take a long signal enough, and then you have to take seconds in order to make a single reading. This becomes problematic. Okay, this here is called noise. Okay, we have noise in everything because quite frankly, static electricity is around us all the time, everywhere. Uh, you slightly brush anything, there is a small static discharge, there's an exchange of electricity. Okay, so not only do we need a signal that is magnitude independent, but we also need one that is not affected by noise. So I'm gonna say noise independent. Okay. So because we, we need a signal that is both magnitude independent and noise independent, what we end up with is the concept that we can do this through digital information. All right. So let's say when I communicate with Zane, I'm going to send you five volts, but you're going to accept anywhere from two to really 10 volts. Okay. So Zane accepts from here to here. So if I send him five volts, it's gonna be substantial, okay? So here, you're gonna be reading whether or not it's on or off, because if you're not getting something in this range, it's off. But if you are getting something in this range, I'm sending you something, okay? So it's either on or off. Now, what that does, is if we do either on or off, I can send a signal that looks like this. And Zane, what Zane will read is putting that two volt threshold here. Zane will read, this period is on, this period is off, this period is on. Okay, and that allows for communication. And now this very, very noisy signal which doesn't mean a whole lot otherwise, I can now use to communicate with Zane, okay? And I'm now unaffected by noise, and I'm now unaffected by magnitude changes, okay? This is the principles of digital communication, all right? Any, any uh, question as to why this is a better format for transmitting information? Ivana says yes, that's all I needed. Now, there are some issues that arise with digital information. In an analog system, if you want to take an analog measurement, you take an analog measurement as fast as possible, as many times as possible. You can get as much information as possible in as fast as you can collect that information. In digital systems, you have the transmitter and the receiver have to be operating at the same time incident. And timing becomes something that's really critical. And that's something we're gonna be discussing a little bit later. Um, but there are issues with digital communications. So the idea behind digital systems. These are systems that operate between A high and low value bless you at a dedicated 
time f frequency f time interval. That's what I was looking for. To send communications and information. Okay, and here digital systems are specifically for information. Okay, we've moved on from power. We're now talking about flow of information. All right, so our high value is represented by a true, a one, or an on. Our low value is represented by a false, a zero, or an off. Okay? And there are other ways of identifying uh, high and low, but these are the most common three. Uh, encoding true and false is pretty off, is pretty common. Um, what you saw last week was a lot of ones and zeros, which was representing highs and lows. Um, so we can take this and then we can turn this into now exchanging information. If I send a signal and it is high, low, high, low, high, and I have a set periodicity for where my clock timing is, every time you see a mark, it'll take a measurement. And every time it takes a measurement, it will then take that measurement, turn around and say, here's what we have. Okay? So, the clock timing is important, and that, that is the uh, dedicated time interval. It states, here's when a point occurs. Here's when a point occurs. Okay? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, uh, more about clock signals at a point. But then what this allows us to do is this allows us to generate a stream of binary numbers. If we go into treating this as ones and zeros, so what we have here is this one would be read as a one, this one would be read as a zero, this is a zero, this is a zero, this is a one, this is a zero, one, one, one. Okay? And I've now transmitted a signal. I have now communicated successfully with Zane in a way that is both magnitude independent and noise independent. What are you doing? <laughs> okay. Um, so as we get into digital systems, we need a little bit of background when it comes to binary systems. Okay, because we're now dealing with ones and zeros, and this is one of the most common forms of communication. Um, let's go ahead and dive into binary math. Okay, basic idea behind binary math, uh, most math is performed in a decimal system that is base 10. For binary math is in base 2. All right. So, when we talk about binary math, oh, when we talk about decimal math, let's say I'm going to represent the number uh, uh, 2022, okay? In a decimal system, we write 2022. What this stands for is this is a sum of numbers, okay? This is equal to 2 times 10 to the third plus 0 times 10 squared plus 2 times 10 to the first plus 2 times 10 to the zeroth. That's what that represents. This is what makes it a base 10 system. Every digit in this number is multiplied by 10 to the position relative to, there's an assumed decimal point here, 
relative to the position relative to that decimal minus one place. So that the position immediately to the left of the decimal point is times 10 to the zero with. Okay? And we can take this principle and apply it to binary systems very easily. So here, if I had 1, 0, 1, 1, this would be 1 times 2 to the third plus 0 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the first plus 1 times 2 to the zeroth. Which that would be 2 to the third is 8, 2 to the first is 2, and then 2 to the zeroth is 1, so that would be 1, 3, 8, this would be the number 11. Binary maths. Okay, this would have been really helpful before last Thursday's lecture. <laughs> As he starts throwing up ones and zeros and all of you are like, oh, oh heck no. Please, what's going on here? Why are we doing numbers in 10? Okay. Now, again, to build this concept up, the number 2022 is actually, the number 2022 with an infinite number of zeros preceding it, which means this can be any number of digited numbers, but then you just have 0 times 10 to the 4th, plus 0 times 10 to the 5th, plus 0 times 10 to the 6th, on to infinity. And we can do the same thing with a digital number. So if you see a digital number that is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 101, what number is that? What? In a, in a binary system, what a number is this? 8. 8 would be 1, 0, 0, 0. 6. 6. Six would be one one zero. This is five. Nail it. It's it's fine. I'm introducing this concept to you. So here, this is going to be one times two to the zeroth plus zero times two to the first plus one times two to the second, and then all the rest of them are zeros. Okay. So this ends up being two to the zeroth is one. So this ends up being 1 times 1. Two, this is plus 0. And then 2 squared is 4, so it ends up being 4 plus 0 plus 1, which ends up being 5. It is nice when you, when you explain it out like this, OK? So this represents a unique digit that represents the number 5. Now here, it takes three digits for us to represent the number 5. In a decimal system, it takes one. Okay? Now let's say I want to represent the number 17. All right? So I'm going to erase all of this because this is, this all needs to go away. Gerard, you can go. This is being live streamed, so just watch the end of this video. Okay, so let's say I want to represent the number 16, and that's 16 base 10 in binary. It ends up, hold on, how would I represent the number 16 in binary? So you said one zero 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 zero. So this would be times two to the zeroth, which is one, times two to the first, which is two. No, yeah, times two to the second, which is four, times two to the third, which is eight, times two to the fourth, which is sixteen. You gotta remember that the first number is two to the zero with. That that always trips me up. 
Okay, so what about, all right, now I want to take 17. How do I do that? One, zero, 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 one. Right, because it just adds one to it. All right, what about, what about 57? <laughs> okay, now hold on, hold on. Before we get into this, I'm sure you can figure out the method. I'm going to give you the method. Okay, there's two ways of converting from decimal to binary. At least two ways that I think are nice. Okay, so here we have, I'll give you way one. This is the way that makes the most sense to me. This is the divide by two principle. Okay. So here's what we do. Um, the way that this works is you divide by two. If when you divide by two, if there's a remainder of one, write it. Otherwise, write zero. That's it. Simple principle. So, and we're going to build then from the right side of the number to the left. So if we want to represent 57 using this principle, what we do is we say 57 divided by 2. Well, what's 57 divided by 2? That's uh, 23, 20, 28, or remainder 1, right? So our first number over here is a 1. When we take 28 divided by 2, what do we get? 14. What's our remainder? Take 14 divided by 2, what do we get? 7. So we take 7. How many, what's our remainder on that? What's our remainder in dividing 14 by 2? Yeah, Still 0. Okay, we divide 7 by 2, what do we get? 3 remainder 1. So I write 3, I put up a 1. You divide 3 by 2, well, what do we get? 1 remainder 1. We divide 1 by 2, what do we get? We get 0 remainder 1. And then from then on out, we get zeros. Okay? So the way that you represent 57 in binary using the divide by 2 principle is 111001. Okay? So let's check our work. This is equal to 1 plus, this is 2 to the first, 2 to the second, 2 to the third, 2 to the fourth, times 2 to the fifth. Okay. So what is 2 to the fifth? 32. 32. So this is 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 1. So this is 48, 56, 57. That's the, one, that's the first way of doing decimal to binary conversion. The second way, and some people prefer this way a little bit more. Um, this is using um, subtract multiples of 2. Okay, so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out an orders of 2 table. Okay, so here we have 0, 1, oh no we don't have a 0. This is 2 to the 0th is 1, 2 to the 1st is 2, 2 to the 2nd, so this would be 2 to the n, and this is 
No, this would be n, and this would be 2 to the n. So this is 4, 3 is 8, 4 is 16, 5 is 32, 6 is 64, 7 is 128, 8 is 256, and you can just keep going. Okay, so this is the value of n, and this is 2 to the n. If this was a decimal table, it would look like this. n, 10 to the n, and this would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and this would be 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, it just keeps going, okay? So we've just taken this concept and applied it to a decimal system. So here, when you subtract orders of two, you're subtracting the largest order of two from a number. Okay? And then that digit becomes a one. If you can't subtract the largest value, then it's a zero. All right, so for example, we'll use 57 again. What is the largest factor of two, order of two, that is less than 57? 32. It's 32. So here, this minus 32, this ends up equaling 25. Right? So in our digits place, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That is 2 to the fifth. We write a 1. What is the largest order of 2 that is less than 25? 16. So 16 is 2 to the 4th. We write a 1. 25 minus 16 is 9. What is the largest order of 2 that is less than 9? Here, 8 is 2 to the 3rd, so we write a 1. This is left with a one. What is the largest order of two? No, it's zero. Okay, and then everything else is a zero there. And you'll see we get the same exact number. One, 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 zero, zero, one. <coughs> okay, so you pick your poison, whichever one you prefer. Uh, a lot of people prefer the divide by two because you can plug that in your calculator and just continuously hit divide by two. Some people prefer this because quite frankly, if you have a table of these numbers, it's just compare like, it's bigger than this one, smaller than this one. I'll just write that value of n. I don't care how you do it. These are the two ways that I have presented. There are probably other ways that exist if you want to use one of those methods, that's fine too. I'm just giving you two that make sense to me. Any questions over this? All right, I'm going to give you some binary numbers. I'm going to give you some decimal numbers, and you need to convert them. Okay? Can I erase this? Yes. Hearing no objections. All right, so. So what I want you to do, over here, I want you to take a binary number, convert it to decimal. Over here, I want you to take a decimal number and convert it to binary. All right? And then I'll show the answers at the start of the next lecture. So I'll just give you time to work after I write these. And we'll come back here around 10.05, get back together. So 
binary to decimal, first of all, we have 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay? 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And then 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay, decimal to binary, we're going to start with 111. We're going to do 258. And then we're going to do um, 3015. And then we're also going to do uh, um, 849. Okay, so I'll... I'll do a face reveal in my next YouTube video, so like and subscribe and ring that bell.